We may watch other movies, baby, but you know we love you best. We discuss Stolen, starring Nicolas Cage. Flophouse. I'm Dan McCoy. Hey, I'm Stuart Wellington. And I'm Elliot Kalin in the number three spot, but first in America's hearts. Uh, I don't yeah, know if no, you have any reason. People have spoken. I looked up our Q wait, ratings. Wait. Is there a Flopper's I'll Choice Awards it. that uh, <laughs> I was unaware Stuart of? Stuart checked his phone and he said he'd allow it. <laughs> hey, enough goofing around, guys. It's time to make the donuts. <laughs> okay, is that what we're doing? This Suddenly podcast? you're a cruel taskmaster. <laughs> Um, welcome back to the Flop House, a podcast where we watch a movie, perhaps a bad movie, and then we discuss it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> perhaps. Yep. <laughs> I just don't. I just. I feel bad. You don't want to. You know. Yeah. Wanna every now, to every now and then, we throw Seven Samurai in there, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to throw off the listeners. The seven throw, Samurai. We throw <laughs> floating weeds in the mix. Yeah. Every now and then, we just throw a uh, other Japanese movie in there. <laughs> <laughs> Dead or Alive Apparently. 2. That's all. <laughs> I mean, that is a bad movie. That's a great movie where they turn into angels and yeah. have the montage of killing people and giving money to happy African kids. <laughs> um, so, this evening we watched a little movie called Stolen. Stolen. Starring Nicholas Cage. Nic- <laughs> yep, it's, we haven't seen a Nicholas Cage movie in a while, so I'm excited about like this one. Like three months without a cage. <laughs> So should we explain why we're mispronouncing Nicholas Gay? Just well, I think <laughs> listeners to the past episode are familiar with this story. That we, was we pre E W. So, so we should was yeah. Or Pew. We should, we should P-E-W. Look, post E W. And if somebody is picking this podcast up for the first time, we don't actually want them to get the joke, right? Exactly. No, yeah, yeah. It's all about forcing people out and making them not enjoy it by feeling they're not cool enough to get these inside jokes. So Buckle on your headphones, folks. We're going to talk about this movie. It's, it's going it's to be a bumpy here. Uh, so we, we should explain that. This movie stolen. We saw the trailer last year, mm-hmm. and it looked fantastic. And for, it's a Nicolas Cage film uh, that, for some reason, in the trailer, the voiceover guy, who has a perfectly normal voice, uh, announces the name of the star as Nicolas Cage. <laughs> he, like, uh, he throws an extra syllable in there. Yeah, in, in otherwise semi-professionally, I would say, <laughs> produced trailer. Not very, the most... very, not the most slick trailer. Mm-hmm. It could, it could have easily been a directed DVD film. Did we ever resolve that? According to Whatever. Wikipedia, no, that it was released in the theaters. Release. Okay, uh, this is a movie that in America made a little bit over three hundred thousand dollars. Hot dog! <laughs> and <laughs> worldwide box office gross was a little over two million dollars. Okay, so th- it's probably on top, right? It's no, it's a budget black? of thirty-five million. Oh, which holy is cow. still very cheap for this type of movie. I mean, this is a Nicolas Cage action thriller, mm-hmm. and it, Danny it, Houston doesn't come cheap. No, Dan- all those hats he wears. <laughs> <laughs> Malin Ackerman, very expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, they shot it in New Orleans. So, yeah. you know, that's expensive. The big easy. Home of 12 Rounds, <laughs> as I believe they renamed it. They, named, they, they, gave yep. the, they renamed the city Home of 12 Rounds. Yep. When they gave the key to the city to John Santa. They yeah, and then he it. bent it in half. <laughs> and then he ate it. He thought there was chocolate inside. <laughs> he didn't care. He just thought it was th- something. Mm-hmm. He just eats, he just ingests matter. <laughs> and it becomes matter muscle. Eater, man, is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, so... This is a movie that so this is a movie it doesn't it's a movie. it doesn't look expensive. It's a suspense thriller. It doesn't look like a movie that 35 million dollars on a lot the of money screen, to. right? It's kind I, of all up there. It, but it doesn't look bad. Yeah, it looks it looks more expensive than movies that we've seen that cost a lot more. For more instance, expensive than Nicolas Cage movies. That's seen. my boy last week, which was a 70 million dollar movie Ugh. where you saw none of the money on screen. Yeah, the, not once did they do a shot of just like a big pile of money. I mean, this was a competently directed <laughs> Never saw it on screen. <laughs> this is a competently directed action film from uh Simon West, who you may know as the director of uh Tomb Raider and uh and uh, more recently the mechanic the brother of simon east gone in 60 seconds right no he didn't do that but he's best enjoyed i think for con air oh right right which right, right, is right. a very enjoyable stupid movie <laughs> yeah. in which the audience is supposed to cheer for a child killer being on the loose at the end <laughs> when steve Buscemi is 
not only on the loose, has money in his pocket <laughs> and a crowd of people around cheering him. This is a character who throughout has been treated as the worst murderer in the world. Yeah. But to the audience, it's like, yeah, our cute buddy. <laughs> a friend, Mr. Pink. <laughs> <laughs> it's back in the game. Yeah. I thought he was all chopped up in that wood chipper, but nope, he's okay on the Con Air. <laughs> all the same character. I tried to book a flight on Con Air, and it was much more expensive than I thought it would be. <laughs> Only movie they show? The Rock. <laughs> weird. So weird, yeah. Mm. Um, but they show the version that stars The Rock, where he plays all the parts. Oh, okay. And he just performed it in his basement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Should we talk about what this movie was about? I guess. So, Nicolas Cage plays the best bank robber in the world. Of course he is. He's Nicolas Cage. Yeah. And in the beginning, he and his gang, made up of uh, Malin Ackerman, and uh, who She's else? the hottie. Who else was in it? Josh MC, Lucas. MC Ganey. Who, MC Ganey was the body. MC who you know is uh, Mr. Friendly from uh, Lost. Or you know him from- Swamp Thing from Con Air. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he, and he was That was a, his character's name, and he was the pilot. Uh, and he was in another Flophouse movie. Uh yeah, you told it to me earlier, and I've already forgotten. I it. forgot it too. Uh, and you uh, made... like ten thousand BC or oh, something. Wait, he wa- played one of the manics. No, he's wild hogs. Wild, <laughs> oh, wild hogs. hogs. He was like a biker or something, or maybe a sheriff. He's a and... guy who looks like a biker, and he's also a rapper. MC Ganey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. master of ceremonies. Ganey. Now, uh, so they have a they have a bank robbing crew. Mm-hmm. They're the best bank robbers, and they're in New Orleans, mm-hmm. which is how you say New Orleans <laughs> if you're in New Orleans. So they're in New Orleans. <laughs> And they're going to rob, it looks like... A the, bank. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like they're going to rob the Gagalins Diamond Exchange. And there's all these FBI agents around, led by Danny Houston, mm-hmm. who is not yet wearing a hat. He is hatless. He the is subject hatless. is hatless. <laughs> <laughs> I repeat. Okay, don't engage until he puts the hat on. Watch him. Move, move, move. Is he putting a hat on? No, no, he's just scratching his head. Okay, hold back, hold back. Uh, so there, it looks like they're about to rob a diamond exchange, which involves drilling through a Toy Story wall, a Toy Story wall, <laughs> drilling through a Toy Store wall, and going into the the diamond building. That sounds yeah. right. The FBI rushes in. They were double hatched, double crossed. Wait, they're not robbing the diamond exchange. They're robbing the bank. Ah! They break through a safe. They rob it of ten million dollars in mm-hmm. cash bucks. Wrapped in plastic. Uh, and unfortunately, Nicolas Cage and uh, what's his name? Lucas. Josh Lucas. Josh yeah. Lucas. They're leaving the bank. But, but before he looks leave, like a normal guy at Josh, this point in the movie. And he looks like a handsome blonde man. And Josh Lucas is very sad to leave behind a bunch of gold. Of course. Yeah. He's looking at it. There's he's big like, gold piles never of gold. Worth zero. <laughs> Like I could sell this gold to William Devane for big bucks, but yeah. they got to leave it behind. If anyone's watching news channel networks <laughs> at, in, during the day, you'll get that joke. Uh, but he said, "He says I love shiny things, and gold is the shiniest." Yeah. And Nicholas goes, he "Hey, we've got ten million dollars right here. Let's just go, okay?" <laughs> and they're rushing out of the bank, and a janitor or somebody it's sees like, them like, and hey. says, "Hey, where are you guys going?" And uh, where are you running with that bag full of money? <laughs> and uh, Josh Lucas. Hits that guy and is about to shoot him. And Nicholas Cage is like, "We're not killers, okay? Don't kill him." And they fight. They're literally the van. People in the van, the getaway van, can see them down mm-hmm. an alley. They get in a fight, and in the middle of it, Nicholas Cage shoots Josh Lucas in the knee to get yeah. him to stop. He throws him in the Again, van. I'm not in support of that. But Any Nick, sort of knee injury. But yes. the, <laughs> and this is it's like we watch movies in a row, guaranteed to to infuriate. It's Dan. like every time a guy, uh, like a bad guy in a movie, gets hit in the crotch. I'm like, hey, come on, that, that, that that's smart. Because you're a giant penis. Yeah, like at the like at the end of the Power Rangers movie when they knee the uh, the giant monster in the balls. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Giant penis I, monster. I, I would be Power lying Rangers. if I said I had seen the Power Rangers movie. <laughs> okay, well, continue. <laughs> Or like whenever a uh, a guy gets his foot stepped on in a movie, and I'm like, all right, okay, <laughs> foot stuff. <laughs> You're into foot play? <laughs> Not really, but it's a popular fetish. So yeah, I, I, mean, I thought I'd jump it. on the foot <laughs> fetish bandwagon. I was, uh, I was sure, actually, you want to try it out? Yeah, I was actually talking about this today. How I'm disturbed that like if you put any actress's name <laughs> into Google, immediately feet will pop up behind it, yeah. which is apparently like. Foot fetishism is much larger than I expected because that is the number one you know result. What's, you know what's any... even larger than foot fetishism? What? Big foot fetishism. <laughs> what? Bigger feet, bigger fetish. <laughs> Look at the size of those footprints. <laughs> so for some guys, that's like an enormous boob print. Yeah. Um... <laughs> anyway. There's a guy somewhere masturbating to the idea of 
uh, Bigfoot and some Manola Blahnik. He's just <laughs> masturbating to Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah. There's a guy who has cut out pictures of shoes from a magazine, and he watches He's Harry and the Hendersons and holds it up to the TV screen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. Old man of the forest. <laughs> Those pumps look pretty good. You got the biggest feet. The biggest feet. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, so we're going to talk about the movies more? Or what's going on? So uh, we're about five minutes into the movie, too. Uh, Nicholas Cage can't get on the getaway van. So he gets into a police – he beats up a police officer and gets into his car and takes the – A little bit of parkour. Takes the police on a high-speed mm-hmm. car chase. A surprisingly exciting chase, It's a pretty good say. car chase through a parking garage and all that. But finally, he gets caught, mm-hmm. and they say, come out with the money. And he's got a duffel bag with $10 million wrapped in plastic – and he's in a building with a barrel fire that some homeless people were warming their yeah. hands around. It's, it's love barrel fires. And because it gets so cold yeah. at night, New Orleans, <laughs> known for its rough, its rough cold nights, yep. New Orleans, uh, he throws Maybe they're the, putting some crawdads in that yeah. barrel fire. He, he, Cooking up a catfish. <laughs> <laughs> Have some gumbo. <laughs> So he and Nicolas Cage walks out with the money. He says, I threw the money in the fire. I threw it in the fire. He's got, they've got... No evidence. No evidence. Well, he but, doesn't tell them that, that at that time. Burned with the heat of a thousand does. suns. And he gets, he gets, <laughs> no, just, just fire. <laughs> he, gets a, he gets a reduced sentence because they can't find the evidence. Yeah. Even though there's no way that $10 million in bills wrapped in plastic are, is going to burn up in one of those barrels so they're not going to figure out what happened. I don't know. Maybe it was like the, you know, an atomic barrel. <laughs> okay, sure. Well, I'll accept you know. it. I'll accept it for the purposes of stolen. <laughs> for the purposes of stolen, that barrel has atomic fission technology. <laughs> For that purpose of stolen, that barrel shines as bright as the sun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just uh, like Nicolas Cage's smile. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is brighter than the sun, that Cage smile. Cut to eight years later. Nick Cage is getting out of jail as a free man. First stop is at a newsstand to buy a ratty blue teddy bear <laughs> for his now grown daughter. Mm-hmm. Semi-grown. She's like 15. Yeah, sure. And then he gets Check picked up by... number two over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> grown at 15, huh? Huh? <laughs> Let's I'm just continue. Trying get, I'm just trying to get this started. That's all. No, I'm it's about to barf. It doesn't stick. I'm the guy with the Bigfoot fetish, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and he gets picked up by the FBI, by Danny Houston, who is now wearing a hat. And you know what? A pork pie hat. A pork pie hat, because that's what cops wear when they reach a certain age. Yeah, in the intervening eight years, he got way into wearing a hat. Yeah. <laughs> Can you blame him? It looks great on him. No, of course. He's starring in Police Detectives of a Certain Age. <laughs> It's and he wears a pork pie hat. Him, Ed O'Neill, and uh, uh, some other guy who played a cop at some point. Sure. He's just recycling Andre Brower. Andre? Brower. Andre Brower? <laughs> Andre Brower. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and Ray Brower. That, that's Andre Brower's uh, when he got the sex change. Oh, Andre. He, Andre yeah. Anyway, so uh, oh, it's eight boy. years later. There's he a goes, hat. He has, I think we got the <laughs> hat down. They drop him off at his daughter's house. I, we never see the daughter's mother. So I guess she's just a fifteen year old. She's got to be on her beautiful. <laughs> and uh, her daughter—it doesn't go well. His first meeting with his daughter, he gives her the teddy bear. She's a little old for Takes it. Takes the teddy bear initially, though. Takes it initially to make him feel better, but the conversation does not go well. He tries to explain that it's not his fault. He became a criminal. Doesn't go over. She leaves to go to her shrinks <laughs> appointment because apparently she has abandonment issues. Mm-hmm. If you couldn't tell that from her pixie cut. But unfortunately, I don't know what that means. <laughs> what? Unfortunately, she gets into the wrong taxi cab, as we'll find out in a second. Then Nicholas Cage goes to visit his old pal, Malian Ackerman, who's now a bartender. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's- eight years looks great. Yeah. Has not aged a day. Nobody in the movie has aged a day except for Nicolas Cage's daughter, I assume. And uh, the movie attempts to hang a lantern on that by having uh, Nicolas Cage say, you're aging younger, but still. <laughs> Eight years later and you are still and you look younger than you did before. Yeah. No, no dice movie. We get what you're selling. <laughs> We're not buying. I mean, MC Ganey looks like, what, 95 years old <laughs> yeah. at this point? And uh, so, but he MC also got... MC Scat Ganey. <laughs> <laughs> from ger- what he did, the German porn version. Yikes! Of MC Ganey. Uh, raps. You really, you really are not doing a great job of keeping this Furbazoid title <laughs> off of you. <laughs> All right. Well, I was talking about Bigfoot porn earlier, and now you seem like the pervert. <laughs> anyway, so we're barely into this movie. Uh, so he got got a package, and it starts ringing while he's talking to Maylene Ackerman. Opens it up. It's a phone from an unknown caller. Oh, that's weird. He picks it up. 
That's because this movie's called Unknown, right? No, it's not. It's called Stolen. <laughs> now, Did he steal the phone? I don't get it. No, he's going to steal some other... He stole $10 million to steal some other stuff. But wait, I thought he burned it, so he didn't really steal it. No, you can still steal something even if it's destroyed. Okay, continue. And now, she told him that Josh Lucas has died and that MC Ganey is just an old man now. He gets a phone call on this new, brand new phone. It's his old bank robbing partner josh lucas Mm -hmm. Uh uh-oh a ghost from beyond the grave no you'd think yeah but actually he's become a horrid gross (laughs) shell of himself a golem of a man and i don't mean golem the good kind of golem i mean the bad kind of golem (laughs) somehow in the intervening years he's grown long ratty blonde hair i mean in in eight years he i believe he can grow long (laughs) ratty blonde (laughs) ratty blonde hair it looks like the wig that uh jeff daniels was wearing in dumb and dumber and he's got yellowed teeth and then also impossible. He, he's lost his uh, he's lost one his, his leg, the his, one that he got shot his in. His left, the lower half of his left leg, and now he has, has one of those like Blade Runner style like uh, spring. Yeah, legs. the kind of thing that like a robo that pirate. Roger Hauer have. from Blade Runner wears. <laughs> no, the fucking That's, the guy that killed his Oscar girlfriend. Oscar Pistorius, who allegedly <laughs> killed allegedly. his girlfriend. <laughs> thank you. Until proven guilty, which All he right. will be, he allegedly. Thank you for- Thank you for not getting the flop house suit, guys. And thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. (laughs) Your hearts are true. Your pals and confidants. You know, if you two threw a party together for some reason, invited everyone you knew, I think you'd see the biggest gift, maybe in monetary value, not in size, because I'm going to give you a giant teddy bear or something, would be from me. And the card (laughs) attached would say... Thank you for being a friends. (laughs) Dun 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 dun. We're gonna get sued for another reason. (laughs) So so wait, it says dun 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 (laughs) dun. Well, I wrote out the music. (laughs) Uh, So it's his old, supposedly dead criminal buddy who's now got a mean mat on. Looks like a crazy old voodoo master now. (laughs) He looks he looks like like a a gross a a gross like kind of rat wizard of a man. He crawled out of hell to take his revenge. <laughs> I mean, that would be interesting. It turns <laughs> yeah. out he didn't do that. It turns out he faked his own death, partly by chopping off half of three of his fingers. Yeah. So he's uh, he's an onion knight, if gross. you will. You know? Gross. Yeah. And uh, he has... I won't, by the way. Yeah, he, You won't? It's not like he carries... <laughs> don't, don't associate he's not that associated thing with this other thing. <laughs> with Sir like he, Davos. He didn't carry his fingers around with him in a pouch. I mean, come on. Oh, no, he didn't. He used them to fake his own death yeah. in a pouch. Yeah. Now, he... Uh oh, he's a taxi driver now. He picked up Nicholas Cage's daughter in his taxi, and now his daughter, Nicholas Cage's daughter. No, I'm sorry, Nicholas Cage's daughter <laughs> in his taxi, and he's he he says to him, "I want that ten million dollars, or else your daughter's dead. I'll give you twelve hours." And Nicholas Cage is like. But I burned that money. I burned it. He's like, yeah, sure you did. I don't believe you. My leg doesn't believe you. The me. audience doesn't believe that happened. <laughs> Give it to me in 12 hours. I'm going to spend that time just driving the streets of New Orleans. <laughs> during Mardi Gras. During Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday. And with my, with your daughter in my trunk and get me the money or you're, she's dead. By the way, uh, he did put a bunch of glow-in-the-dark stars in the trunk to make it more homey for her as he drove around. So that was a nice move. There are a couple little to touches her. in the movie, like Danny Houston's hat and the little glow-in-the-dark stars he puts in the trunk. They made the I like that they made the bad guy look like a weird ratty monster. <laughs> I mean, he just I mean, looks you like, like a... weird ratty monsters in general. Yeah, in general. Like, like your like, castle freaks. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're snake mans. He is kind of what I imagine the Judas Priest song Nightcrawler to be about. <laughs> That's the guy who who crawls into the town in the middle of the night to feast on flesh and blood. Mm. Um, or he's just like a ratty taxi driver, too. I don't Either know. Um, so Nicolas Cage is at is at a loss. He's got to find this money that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. But what he really has to do is find his old partner so he can get his daughter back. One last heist, sure. Yeah, well, but not one last heist yet. First, he, <laughs> oh, he he's tries... He's going to heist his daughter back from this jerk. <laughs> yeah, he's, it's called daughter heist. <laughs> <laughs> one man has Catch to steal cab. one daughter. Uh, there was a, this movie could be called Catch That Cab, Catch That Cash, or Catch <laughs> That Kid, <laughs> or Catch That Cage. <laughs> So he tries to get the FBI's help. They don't believe him. Sure, your dead buddy is around, and you, and that's why you want our help. And you, it doesn't. They don't believe. That's him. why you're violating your parole. So he has. Sure, you burned all that money, even though we couldn't find any of it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Tell it to my hat. <laughs> Do you believe him? No, I don't. My hat doesn't believe you. Uh, so he has. To, he can't get their help. He breaks some laws to get some information. He tracks down their old friend MC Ganey. MC mm-hmm. Ganey. He knows what's going on, but he doesn't want to help him. He's mad that he burned that money, too. And, and he's s- mad that he made him drop his lunch. <laughs> yeah. 
He had a big paper sack with his lunch in it. Nicolas Cage made him drop it for some reason. Uh, and I wish that it, when it fell, it made a squeak, like a, like a really cartoony squish sound, or even like a boing, but oh, that it doesn't. Oh, full of chili. <laughs> It's just a bag of chili, <laughs> just dripping through this paper bag. Uh, but the police, the FBI, come in. There's a fight out. By the way, bag There's of a- chili is now copyright. Flophouse. Uh, any attempt to make Flophouse. a restaurant based on a bag of chili, it's uh, you owe us money. Flophouse brand bag of chili <laughs> from the makers of Bag of Coleslaw. <laughs> it's a garbage bag full of coleslaw. Stick your hand in it. Pull some out. Eat it. <laughs> wow, we didn't even really try on that slogan. <laughs> no. It's more user instructions. <laughs> we could have made that sound more appetizing. Maybe with a diagram for a poster. <laughs> I think I see the problem and why our coleslaw business didn't take off. Well, also guys. the mascot is the mascot is Garby the garbage bag, not appealing or appetizing. <laughs> Stick your face in me. <laughs> Celebrity endorsement by MC Ganey. <laughs> Come on down to bag of coleslaw. It's full of mayonnaise goodness. <laughs> so they have a big fight. In the shootout, MC Ganey gets killed. Nicolas Cage goes on the run, and the police are just shooting guns at him. They're just firing semi-automatic <laughs> yeah, weapons at him. That SWAT team guy just makes a jumping shooting machine gun motion. Yeah. And at this point, and his like crimes a... are breaking his parole and accessing <laughs> FBI files. And they're just firing automatic, semi-automatic weapons like at him. There's apartments all around. This is like a residential area. They're just shooting up. Oh, it's New Orleans. It's in bad bad shape. Anyway. <laughs> after whoa. after John Cena got through with after, it. They're still, yeah, they're still recovering from the damage done by 12 rounds. Hurricane Cena. <laughs> uh... Nicholas Cage is on the run. Fine. He's going to do this by himself. He's going to track down his old partner. He almost does it. He mm-hmm. ca- takes a ca- uh, cab driver hostage, uses the radio to track down his old partner's cab. There's a lot of car chasing. Uh, the partner almost gets caught by a cop because the girl in the trunk has broken one of the bar- one of the brake lights, one mm-hmm. of the taillights, and tries to escape. She almost breaks through and gets a phone left by an Australian passenger <laughs> that Josh Lucas beats the shit out of. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of a really incident. unappealing Australian guy who you're kind of happy to see get beat up. <laughs> I don't know. He's just a tourist there to get laid. I don't know. He's just no. looking for Sheila's. He's talking about Sheila's billabongs, you know, mm-hmm. some room meat, all sorts of stuff. Uh, <laughs> wombats and what have you. The dingo ate his baby. He should have, have some sympathy. So anyway, uh, Nicolas Cage, I'm just going to cut it as quick quick as I can. Sure. Because it's, it's actually not bad. There's a lot of little incidents and things like that. Finally, Nicolas Cage, he can't track. He's been double tricked again. And he yeah. can't find the taxi cab. The, ta- the, the taxi guy switched out uh, his GPS with another taxi, so there's no way of tracking this guy. No way. He's just going to have to meet him at the rendezvous spot in abandoned amusement park <laughs> with money in hand. But he doesn't have the money. But what does this guy love more than money? G O L D. Gold. Uh-huh. gold. gold. <laughs> he only loves gold. He loves only gold. So it sounds like Nicolas Cage is going to have to steal himself some gold. Mm-hmm. He takes Melina Ackerman in. She doesn't say, just when I thought I was done, or like, you know, something like that, but she should. Or, I'm getting too old for this shit, even though I haven't aged in eight years, but she doesn't say that. So, but they have kind of an interesting plan to get the gold. They're going to go beneath the floor of the gold vault, mm-hmm. melt through it. And then melt the gold, and it's going to fall into sewer water and cool in big lumps that look like gold poop. <laughs> and they'll just put that in a duffel bag and carry it around. Looks like gold poop or rocks that have been spray painted gold. I mean, Either have one. you ever seen gold? It looks like rocks that have been spray painted gold. That's fair enough. Fair enough. And all, it looks like dragon poop, basically. <laughs> So they got this bag full of dragon poop. The police are chasing after them. They narrowly escape the police by switching trucks. And. There's some more. There's some a bunch of good car flip stunts throughout the movie, actually. But uh, all about flipping cars with you. Yeah, I just love car flipping movies. <laughs> flip. I, I'm always disappointed when I watch Flip This House because the house never actually flips over. <laughs> it's like, hello, the title promised it. There's no springs, no kind of a trebuchet, <laughs> nothing like a big lever, nothing. <laughs> that show, Flip This Pancake, is a little better. A little but better, but it's, it's not, not that exciting to not, see a pancake. No, flip. it's not that stimulating. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, they do. I mean, I could do that at home. Sure. <laughs> and I do. Uh, That's your fetish. <laughs> Nicholas Cage, yeah, his pancake flipping. <laughs> the motion of a pancake flipping in midair. Oh, that's a real nice flip. <laughs> the other side's getting all toasty now. <laughs> oh, you evenly distribute the heat on both sides. Put chocolate chips in there. Later on, you're going in my belly. <laughs> anyway. Creepy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> 
anyway, <laughs> they meet at the abandoned amusement park. Okay. Nicholas Cage finally confronts fight. Josh Lucas face to face, leg to stump, mm-hmm. and they have a big fight. And Which is much crazier than you would expect. Nicolas Cage gets shot in the gut, and then Josh Lucas just jams his fingers into yeah. Nicolas Cage's bullet hole. It's Meanwhile, not crazy because it's not like a real good fight. It's just really kind of gross. And it's more brutal, brutal than yeah. you expect. At it's the more end brutal. Of this silly movie. Like, because meanwhile, also Nicholas Cage's daughter is, is locked in the, in the trunk. trunk of the car, and Josh Lucas has poured gas all over and, and set it on fire with a road flare. Yeah, so she <laughs> and like Nicholas Cage's arm gets in the fire, he pushes Josh Lucas's face into the fire, yeah. and then he gets in the cab, drives it into the river, and then is about trying to let her out of the trunk. He's trying to let her out of the trunk, which, by the way, like I don't know what is. I mean, I understand the first step of his plan, which was put out the fire, put out the, this car yeah. fire. But Priority step one. number two is get my daughter out of the trunk of this locked car before she drowns, and he doesn't have the keys. I don't know exactly what his. No, the key was. is still in the trunk, but he can't open it. He, like he's not like he doesn't. We don't he's see been him shot in the stomach. Turning the key at any point, he just seems like he's trying to open this locked trunk. He's like, oh, oh he assumes that oh. in that moment he gets super strength because yeah. of, of the stress. My only weakness is a locked <laughs> trunk. <laughs> Uh, but then Josh Lucas comes like, back for one final scare. Like your favorite horror movie monster bursts out of the water, yeah. face all melty scarred face. up, all melty faced, and they're fighting and fighting. Nicolas Cage beats him up uh, and runs him through with a cross with a uh, crowbar, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, like a pry bar. Yeah, and then pries open the trunk. And we then all- Josh Lucas comes back again. <laughs> We were all saying that it would have been better if he pried open the trunk with Josh Lucas's fake leg. With his leg. leg. <laughs> if he had torn the fake leg off and then used that to pry the Why trunk open. Why introduce a fake leg if you're not going to use it to pry open yeah. the trunk? Exactly. That's what Chekhov said. Exactly. That Chekhov did say that. <laughs> the he best did. moment was That's after... That's exactly how he phrased it, too. <laughs> after stabbing Josh Lucas through the stomach and pushing him into the, uh, the sinking trunk, he then closes the top of the trunk mm-hmm. on him. Case closed, literally. (laughs) He should have said case closed. Uh, Or case closed. (laughs) But but Nicolas Cage has this bullet wound. He's already said earlier in the movie, a bullet to the belly hurts a lot and you die slower. It's his greatest weakness. And (laughs) his one vulnerability, bullets to the belly. But the police helicopter arrives. Cop in a hat is there. Cop in a half? Cop in a half. It's, a, it's Burt Reynolds with a little kid on his shoulders wearing a hat. That's my worst nightmare, a kid with a badge. <laughs> uh, they take him away, and then, we don't know, did he survive? Wait, wait, wait hold on. I, I also love, like, uh, the daughter's like, he's not going back to jail, is he? And Danny Houston's like, no, no, uh, the other guy stole the money. Like, and it's just like... The other guy stole that gold. Oh, you mean the guy whose body is <laughs> drowned in a trunk right all of now? Sudden, Danny so he Houston... stole the gold and then he got in a trunk and killed himself? <laughs> all of a sudden, Danny Houston gets very protective of Nicolas Cage, a man who, yes, he did this for justifiable reasons, but has, like, broken his parole many times over, well, running around, stealing things, you have the idea shooting that people. Even before then, you a get the idea... A one-man army. <laughs> He's OMAC, Yeah. <laughs> You get the idea that Danny Houston likes Nicolas Cage a little bit. No, he has affection for it, but... But then by the end, he saved his daughter. You know, he all, only did what he did to save his daughter. He's a, it's, the t- it's the point at the end where the bad guy says, you know what, this good guy's been reformed. I'm gonna... But it's a lot of covering up that has to be done. Oh, yeah. Well, there's, I mean, at least one cop has been killed. So uh, MC Ganey also. Not to mention tons of cars flipped over. Yeah. Mardi Gras ruined. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's called off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ray Nagin is like, you know what? Cancel it. Forget it. But uh, Dr. John is crying. <laughs> <laughs> Just crying into his beard, I assume he has. <laughs> then he's, he's weeping, muttering H Y to himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, we don't Takes know his whether. doctorate down from the wall, tears it up. <laughs> Why did I study? Why did I study for seven years for this? <laughs> my, my, my. Mon Dieu. <laughs> So he's he's basically gambit at this point. <laughs> yeah, mon cherry. Uh, anyway, he he guarantees it. So anyway, the then it cuts to Maylene Ackerman and the daughter are driving in a truck past a cemetery. Oh no, are they going to go visit Nicolas Cage's grave? No, grave. His grave. <laughs> his grave. 
Is he Mulder in a tomb? <laughs> no. They, he's cooking up shrimp. It's the most half-hearted fake out you can imagine. It's because it barely lasts. And it's not even like they show him them driving up. It literally just cuts to Nicolas Cage walking out of a trailer. <laughs> hey, guys. They're gonna it's go- great being alive, right? <laughs> and not dead, which is what I'm not. <laughs> they go, but it turns out Maylene Ackerman still has one of the lumps of dinosaur turd gold <laughs> in the back of her truck. Nicholas Cage picks it up, and we see that he's being watched from a boat yeah. by Danny Houston and Danny Houston's second in command. Danny Houston's sidekick, played by TV's Human Target. And wait a minute, what's Danny Houston doing here? Uh, wait, wearing a really cool, like a different hat. <laughs> wearing Let's... a different hat. Yeah, uh, and but also rooting for Nicholas Cage. They're wa- they're under surveillance, and Nicholas Cage sees the lump of gold, and if he throws it away. Then they don't have any evidence to catch him, but if he yeah. keeps it, they'll be able to throw him in jail. And Houston's like, throw, throw it away, g- throw, throw it away. away. And the other and human targets like, don't throw it away, don't throw it away. What are they going to arrest him for throwing gold? <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> that's not that's fucking crazy. Last time I checked, this is America. <laughs> you can throw as much gold as you want. <laughs> you make it rain gold. Uh, you can eat gold and poop it. <laughs> and yeah, if you want. I hope you're watching the screen because you might not know, you might not catch that for about four seconds. There's a shot uh, that it shows that there's a big stone. Like acorn sculpture or pine cone sculpture <laughs> on the table. There's a gold lump shaped pine cold on the table. A pine what? Cone. Pine cold. Pine cold. <laughs> it's like pine salt, but it makes things cold instead of s- sweet smelling. It's what they spray pine trees with when they get too warm. And the pine cold lady is like Miss, Mrs. Freeze. <laughs> Mrs. Freeze? I wait, imagine. She's, wait, she's trapped in a thing? So that Mr. Freeze has to try and get her out? Yeah, yeah, trapped in a thing. <laughs> It's the thing that keeps her cold, right? So she doesn't turn into a, a dead body? Yeah, in an abandoned refrigerator. She's playing in it, <laughs> and she got stuck inside. She didn't see that episode of Different Strokes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Or that G.I. Joe, the more you know about abandoned fridges. Anyway, <laughs> Nicolas Cage finally decides to get rid of it, throws it the gold in the water, and Danny Houston's like, all right, now I can go back to my my regular life. <laughs> my regular life of hat wearing. And... But uh-oh. No, he can throw his hat away at this point. I wish oh. he then picked up his hat and lit it on fire and then threw it away. <laughs> threw it up into the air like Mary Tyler Moore. The hat flies away and says, my work here is done. <laughs> it's just like the feather at the end of Forrest Gump. Yeah, it's Pete's dragon. But the hat's like, no, one day from retirement. <laughs> <laughs> my wife hat and I were going to hat around the world <laughs> with my hat pension. Uh, but then it turns out, wait a minute. Nicholas Cage threw that big pine cone in the water, and he still has mm-hmm. the gold. <laughs> Stolen is now over. <laughs> Cue uh, Lalo Schifrin style cop show. Music. Now here's the thing. This is a movie. I'm just gonna tell you off the bat. I liked this movie a lot. <laughs> it was super goofy and silly, but it had some genuinely fun actiony scenes, and the score was great. It was like they lifted it wholesale from some '80s cop show, including there's like parts where it's like. Yeah, thirty-five million dollars, Elliot. Most of that went to hats, uh, fake gold, <laughs> Nicholas Cage. <laughs> I assume most of that money went straight to Nicholas Cage's <clears throat> castle broker <laughs> and the IRS. Nicholas but anyway, Cage, the original castle freak. <laughs> <laughs> That guy's a freak. How many of these have we done? How many of these have we done? And you save that fucking gold. I can't believe. Yeah, we found a new way to talk about Nicolas Cage and a new way to talk about Castle Freak. We're episode, what, 708? Yeah. We've you been doing thought, this for 100 years. You would have thought we <laughs> We have we, giant Zardoz beards and never, fucking there's never, diapers been, on. there's never been a time we haven't been doing this podcast. Oh, we're like, it's like The Shining. <laughs> there's a picture from the 20s of us doing this podcast. <laughs> It was a radio show. We all had big mustaches. <laughs> Every time we walk out, we see another version of us walking in. Oh, yeah, it's like Looper. <laughs> oh, we got a whole primer situation going on here. Uh, so, any, But I was just going to say, the music is adorably cheesy. It's just so cop show cheesy. And the characters are all... It like This felt like an hour and 30 minute episode of either the Danny Houston Cop in a Hat show or the Nicolas Cage Greatest Bank Robber show. It was like a, it was like if there was a hat cop show and there was a bank robber show and they did like a sweeps weeks crossover movie of the week. Oh. Oh, that's what, that is what it feels like. Like, uh, like a Macmillan and Wife, like sort of a yeah, like a CBS mystery movie. Yeah. <laughs> like this is a, mo- a TV movie CBS would make, so they could try to spin it off into a show. If it uh, got a big, like the way they did with Kojak, I don't know if that was yeah. CBS, but the way Kojak was done. So like, and Columbo was the same way, I think. So like, and Battlestar Galactica, uh, <laughs> mystery show, yeah, your classic mystery show, Battlestar Turns Galactica. Out the Cylons, dude. <laughs> 
there's, there's a bunch of regular people like high society types and a Cylon in the room and Detective Galactica. <laughs> Detective B Galactica. I think I know who did it. Right, wait, 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 one wait, wait, wait. One more question. One thing I just couldn't understand. One more question, Mr. Cylon. <laughs> so you're a killing machine robot. Oh, yes, I am. A, a case closed. That's... <laughs> <laughs> you say you're a human being. Now, uh, why do you, why are your eyes one red light that goes back and forth? Uh, I have a condition. Uh, mm-hmm. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, just one more question. If you're a regular poison, why do you have big metal claws for hands? And why are you a robot? Um, uh, uh, and the Cylon tries to jump out the window, but a cop leaps out of an ambush and tackles him. <laughs> How did you know the Cylon was the one who did it? Let's just say I had a hunch. Oh, he's also a hunchback. So that pun, so it's always a pun at the end of the episode. Let's say I had a hunch. Looks at the, he looks at the camera and says, okay, he's closed. It's called Battlestar Galactica Hunchback Detective. Stars the late Peter Falk and a Cylon. And it's always a Cylon who did it. And he talks like the guy from the stolen trailer. I don't think we're going to say anything that I'm going to enjoy more than that. So I think we should go on to final judgments. I'm, although, Elliot, I think we've, we've kind of gotten... I got my final judgment. Your judgment. I, think this is a- I mean, does anyone have anything else to say? The movie is, like, we all went into this movie, I think, hoping we would like it a little bit. And I don't know about you guys, but I certainly mm. did. So I'm going to, I'm going to, if we're doing final judgments, I'm going to say this was a movie I kind of liked. Yeah, it, the official categories are good, bad movie, bad, bad movie, movie I kind of like. This hovers, I feel, a little bit between good, bad movie and movie I kind of like. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's like a good, I would say it's a good, like, (laughs) TV movie-ish thriller. It's not as good, like, a B-movie type quality movie as, like, Premium Rush or something like that, for instance. But it's still a lot of fun. I mean, the characters are just running around flipping cars over. (laughs) There's stuff in it that genuinely works, and then there's stuff in it that's... Like super silly, it's but there's ridiculous. nothing in it that I was like, "This is shitty." It's it's so. a bizarro world where Nicolas Cage can beat up two trained FBI field agents, <laughs> and a one legged guy can beat up a young fit Australian guy. Well, that, that's the other thing. It's yeah, it's it's takes place in this yeah backwards place <laughs> where where the weak overpower weak the strong. Weak is strong, and strong is weak. Yes. <laughs> so there is a scene where Nicolas Cage is like. With two two FBI agents in an elevator, and then escapes, and the elevator opens up, and the FBI agents, I guess, wake up from their blackout <laughs> and are handcuffed to the to the art the the handrail in the elevator. It's like there's no way that Nicholas Cage is what like 55 at this point, maybe a little bit younger than that. Yeah. There's no way he beat up these two guys, but like Nicholas Cage <laughs> breaks his own thumb to get us some handcuffs at one point. He is there. This is Nicholas Cage like as an action star, which shouldn't work, but it kind of works. Just through sheer force of him. I mean, he's been an action star for quite a while, but he but feels I mean, like he should have aged out. He's, he's, a, he's an he's, action star that any scene requires him to run. It's like a stutter step. <laughs> <laughs> but also, he's not the he's not like a, he's not like a Jean Claude Van Damme action star who That's like right. beats people up in fights. No, he's like he, a, he's a jumping guy from action explosions star. action star. Yeah, he's not even a Bruce Willis normal guy action star. He's like you know, if Adrian Brody was an action star. Which I guess he is in as some he, movies. He, yeah, Predators. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they, they there's something the movie predators. about child predators. There's something about Nicolas Cage's. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> there's something about Nicolas Cage's sheer de- de- dedication to not giving a shit about most of the movie that sells it to me as a, as an action star. He's very mumbly, but in a, in a fun way in this. Yeah. So what you do? You guys gonna give your your final judgments? He already gave his. Oh, also, that's right. I, I think I'll agree with Dan. I think it's. I think it's a hair above, a hair below movie I kind of liked, and four hairs above. <laughs> uh, uh, good, bad. I didn't realize it was just five hairs separating that. Yeah, it's so close. <laughs> you don't even want to know how Such many a thin line It's like a gypsy's s- whisper. <laughs> <laughs> Such a thin line between sanity and insanity. <laughs> good and evil. We're two sides of the same coin, you and I. So, uh, the coin is, it's a novelty. You've got all the time in the world. <laughs> it's a novelty coin that I put our faces on. I got it at the carnival. <laughs> this, uh. Oh, I thought we were just doing things that villains say to each other. Boy! <laughs> this is the part of the podcast where we uh, answer letters from listeners. It's okay. called the Flophouse Mailbag Segment for Letters from You, the Viewers, to Us, the Flophouse in a Bag Mailed to Us. <laughs> For the podcast, no songs called allowed. the Flop House, <laughs> no songs allowed. But I'll find some way to delay the letters <laughs> segment. Rated R, <laughs> number one, <laughs> April eighth, twenty 
2013. AD2.0.com. I didn't sign off on the name of this segment. Etc. <laughs> I'm halfway through the name of the segment. See, no. All right. Uh, this letter is titled Flophouse TV. Well, we have tuberculosis. <laughs> it's from Ronnie Last Name Withheld. He writes, Hello, Ronnie Dan Dobbs. Stewart, Elliot Housecat, and Al Madrigal, who I assume is screening all of these emails after his hostile takeover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. While I was He's sitting, sitting right there <laughs> glaring at us. While I was sitting on the toilet and reading the latest Entertainment Weekly, which is, Too how, much. Which is how I receive all of my entertainment <laughs> and weekly news, <laughs> I noticed a new MTV show listing. It's a talk show co-hosted by no, none other than Flophouse guest host Sarah Coasted. Schaefer. Episode 22, Vantage Point. That's true. Uh, Nikki and Sarah live on MTV. On MTV, Tuesday nights at 11 p.m. I recommend it highly. Uh, this made me wonder, why have the original peaches not penetrated the boob tube? Keep what? in mind, I don't consider Mr. <laughs> Kalen and Mr. McCoy's cameos on The Daily Show full penetration. I mean, we... <laughs> although <laughs> although Mr. <laughs> Wellington's video drum experience does count. Oh, yeah, when you went in, when you had that videotape in your belly? <laughs> yeah. And you had sex with Debbie Harry? Yeah, of so, course, I did all those things. <laughs> So I further wondered. You said goodbye to the old flesh. <laughs> yeah, why, why do I need that flesh anymore? I've become one with a greater consciousness. <laughs> so I further wondered, what kind of shows would be best tailored to you guys? Here are a few suggestions. Jelly Kalen hosting <clears throat> old-timey movies on would, current classic movies. That's a job I would I would definitely love. Stu and Housecat's story time on Nick Jr., which would be summarily canceled after <laughs> one right. episode for its frank sexual content. <laughs> Dan McCoy would certainly be the third most popular newsman in the New York City area market. Uh, and, That's pretty. Uh, I mean, it's one of the two biggest media markets in the country. Sure, uh, along and, with Davenport. And Ronnie, uh, there's a postscript. He says in a recent episode, Elliot pronounced John Constantine's name as Constantine instead of the actual correct pronunciation. See, it's not only Dan who gets words wrong. PPS, but it's still mostly Dan. Look, as long as I'm it's, Jewish, I'm going to pronounce it John Constantine. It's properly pronounced Constantine. <laughs> Wait, that didn't even sound like Cage. That sounded like a ghost was saying it. <laughs> now, John as, Constantine. As you guys have already acknowledged, we've already been through uh, Stewart's ideal uh, television vehicles. Jazz. But, yep. But Stuart, I, what was it called? Stewart's sex watching par- pirate show. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, he describes he describes other people sex having describer. Sex, <laughs> sex describer. He's a pirate who describes people having sex. <laughs> I don't have a lot of words, so I have to use saxophone sounds. <laughs> But uh, it seemed worth uh, pursuing, uh, you know, like what uh, what our television vehicles should be. Yeah, sure. Well, mine would probably be a tricked out ambulance like Ecto One, <laughs> <laughs> but with a TV in it. That'd be my TV vehicle. <laughs> what would yours be, Dan? What would your show be? I'll tell you what my show is afterwards. Oh wait, I have to. I, I thought we were casting each other. Oh, 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 I see. Oh, well, Dan's would be called the Psy Guy. Okay. <laughs> it's about a it's about a single guy who also has a wife and a cat somehow. Mm-hmm. Who just can't seem to get it together, even though he has a high-paying television job. So it's like the single it's guy. It's a slice of life. With yeah, Jonathan Silverman is what it, you're saying. Yeah, basically, an Ernest Borg, the late Ernest Borgnine plays Manny the doorman. The weird thing, though, you're also psychic. Thus, the name, <laughs> the double meaning of psy. It's, spe- it's spelled P S Y guy. Yeah. But whenever you get a psychic message, you go, oh, <sighs> not again. <laughs> and then you got to do an adventure. That's probably how I would react. But it's all. Or you messages. just don't do the adventure. <laughs> Yeah, if I'm and, tired, I probably wouldn't. And you just watch TV, and there's a Sweeps Week storyline where your knee gets hurt and then is inv- invaded by the spirit of a killer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and your knee is sneaking out at night and killing people and then coming back to your leg. Oh, so that's what, pretty good. So Elliot. what would my show be? It's called The Psy Guy. What <laughs> <laughs> Elliot's... That's a, that's a rated R. <laughs> rated R. It's a rated R show. It's on Spice Channel. <laughs> a lot of hardcore sex, but you don't get to do any of it. Uh, what if Elliot Your knee would, like, does. Elliot could be like a, a Doctor Who style uh, show where like uh, uh, a, cr- tr- a criminologist, a mentalist. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, like Doctor Who, a mentalist criminal. <laughs> uh, no, the Doctor is. No, I'm imagining him traveling through time. I like to it. Old Hollywood. Wait, I don't get it. I Wait, like he's it. a doctor that travels through time. Oh boy! So I can sleep with all my favorite star crushes who have been dead for years, and I'm the pervizoid. But, wait, I mean, he's just talking about sleeping with dead bodies. No, 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 they were living people. I would go back to when they were still alive. So you're going to make them live again? No, I'm going back in time. It's called Elliot Kalen Starfucker. (laughs) Each week I have sex with a different star of old Hollywood. Clark Gable, Spencer Tracy, Rita Hayworth. Clark Gable again, because he was that good. 
<laughs> it's like, I don't care. I'm a straight man, but these are the stars of old Hollywood. Come on, I'm not going to pass. If Clark Gable comes on to me, that's a story I'm going to eat dinner out with uh, for a long time. <laughs> Wait, did you just say eat out? <laughs> yeah. yeah, on that story. Okay. And no, it would go like this. Ingrid Bergman, Myrna Loy, Teresa Wright. That would be my order. That seems pretty good. So then we get start throwing some how other about, stars uh, in. How about your Louise Brooks? Yeah, Louise Brooks, sure. I'd Elliot go back to the twenties. Uh Anna Mae Wong, definitely. Uh Elliot Gould, you got it. Uh but no mustache. <laughs> he has to shave him. it off. It yeah. tickles him. Um, George Siegel with mustache. So this next letter. Wait, what's the name of it? It's called Starfucker? Ellie Kane yeah, Starfucker. Okay. Ellie Kane yeah. Starfucker. Uh this next letter is titled Help Me Get Revenge. Okay, I like the start uh, of this sounds one. Sounds like this Stuart from... Sally. Uh, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing it. First one, practice hugging people, but frowning while you do it. <laughs> I, I apologize for mispronouncing this. Ajahar, last name withheld. So this is, uh, he says, recently my best friend invited me to a ceremony. A where seance. He, where he took command of a, naval, <laughs> of a Navy SEAL team. Oh, wow. Nothing wrong with that in and of itself. However, during the ceremony, he took several thinly veiled jabs, jabs at me and my Green Beret brothers. Since he was at the podium and I was standing at attention. Super intimidated this already. Is, yeah, just the, the fact that this is a Navy SEAL and a Green Beret with, in, in, with, an, yeah. with a beef is really more than we can handle. Outnumbered 50 to 1 by SEALs, I was completely helpless. I have since been plotting against him, conducting covert reconnaissance of his house while seemingly babysitting his children, <laughs> studying his weaknesses of character. He seems to drink a lot of beer and weaknesses of body. Definitely balding, but how can I use that against him? Alas, I was... Stab him in the head. <laughs> the, he no longer has the hair. He doesn't have the hair form to protect his crust. The hair would cushion the blow. Alas, I was shipped a protective off... protective crust. <laughs> what is in your hair, Dan? So you would describe it as a crust. Uh, at last, I was shipped off to a- Afghanistan before I could deliver a devastating blow to his solar plexus, but also before he could inflict further emotional harm against me, mm. or so I thought. Mm. Uh-oh. Last week, I was forced to watch Act of Valor... Truly one of the worst movies ever made. Incompetent, boring, surprisingly unrealistic. I can't prove it, but I think my friend forced his men uh, to film this monstrosity just so I'd be tortured by it later. Not the first movie that would be made just to torture somebody else with it. You may be thinking, we can't make fun of SEALs. They're American heroes. Surely that does not include anyone involved in the making of Act of Valor. Or Andre. Pete, please help. It's a movie about a seal. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, right? We're talking about the soldiers or the animals? Please help out a battle-hardened special forces operator who does not have the ability or wits Hmm. to effectively make fun of his friend. You must fight my fight for me. I believe in you. Please trash Act of Valor for America and Jesus and 9-11. Wow, that's, wow, that's, that's a, a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure, but I think we may have to take that him up on that I at mean, some point. You do put your finger on the uh, the problem, I which think, is we would feel bad making fun of of non if, uh, non professional actors. If I'm going to make fun of a, seals. if yeah. I'm going to make fun of a former soldier, I'm going to make fun of that guy in Battleship that knocks that alien's teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was he actually a former? Yes, yeah, he yeah, was. yeah. That's how he lost his legs. Yeah. He didn't lose him to real, Nicolas real Cage shooting his legs off or something. <laughs> real sensitive, Dan. No, but it's true. We would feel bad making making fun of, especially the acting of guys who are not actors who are there for other skills. So I think so. This is my idea. I don't know if we can do active valor because we're just civilians mm-hmm. and we would get beat up. And Here's we're what all you do. Here's classic revenge never goes wrong ever. Rig it so your friend is elected prom queen. And when she get mm-hmm. he gets up on the stage, dump a bunch of pig's blood on him. Yeah, <laughs> never goes wrong. Yeah, that all yeah. worked perfectly. Classic I mean, we revenge. All, we all watch Carrie, and we we paused the tape when that happened. And like we yeah. high fived each other. Like, and oh, that I nerd got what came from. And then we movie, fell asleep. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then credits roll. <laughs> or like the show Revenge, you could be something I never watch and therefore don't know anything about. <laughs> Classic revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll let we'll think about active valor, but we would we would have to get a letter from the president that said it's okay for us to make fun of Navy SEALs. Yeah. Obama, the ball's in your court. So <laughs> the President next, Obama. Is your ball is in your president court. <laughs> so the next this next letter uh is from uh, But thanks for listening, even from overseas. Appreciate it. This next le- letter is from L. Kennedy. Uh and she writes, I actually I absolutely adore you guys. Whenever I'm in deadline hell, the podcast cheers me right up. Oh, and I think that would be a good movie about a newspaper run by the devil. Okay, I like it. Deadline hell, starring Meryl Streep as the deadline. (laughs) (laughs) 
Hell one. Yep. And Paul Rubens as the hell. <laughs> oh, weird. So she writes... Uh, they fall in love. <laughs> okay. They Elk have a child. That child's a dinosaur. <laughs> God damn, God damn <laughs> it. Dinosaur. <laughs> A sour Dino- dinosaur. <laughs> that child is a dinosaucer. Uh, Al continues to write, Oh, I think Nick Cage has blinded you to the gym that is Billy Who? Zane. you got to do another Ca- Zane movie Nick soon. Nick Cage. <laughs> oh, yeah. We sh- well, we should do another Zane movie. Yeah. She says, Check out Survival Ireland. It's a real treat. <laughs> Sounds like a porno. <laughs> and the main chick shows her boobs. Anyway, well, give up there you the go, hilarious work, Al. Well, who's now, the right, main first, chick, though? First of all, the main chick has a name. Her name is Kelly Brook. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's a, certainly a fine woman's and boobs. And we're all familiar with her boobs from Piranha, the movie that, 3D. that uh, we saw for Elliot's uh, uh, bachelor party. No, it was the day of my wedding. Yeah. The movie Literally that, the day it, that it, we it, saw. It, he was thinking about that movie when he said his vows? Yeah. They're called, yeah, well, they're prayers, technically. Prayers, I mean, okay. it's the day it's of a Elliot's Jewish wedding. Movie. On the morning of, of my wedding, all of us went to go see Piranha 3D. And true story, at this very moment, I still keep the ticket stub in my wallet. Because it was the best day of my life, number one, because of the wedding. Number two, Prona 3D with my pals. <laughs> and also, I, keep... I had Popeyes for lunch. <laughs> and to this moment, I keep the memory of Kelly Brook naked in my brain. Yep. So there's that, too. There's that, too. I mean, the wedding, you've forgotten. Yeah. Oh, man, I got to make room for other stuff. <laughs> there are other boobs to think about. Uh, but uh, I, I, I gave Al Kennedy's uh, full name, though, because I wanted to say... She, uh, she, in her signature, she says the she's the author of the Killer Instincts and Out of Uniform series. What? Now, uh, mentioning Navy SEALs before, I went to her website. The tagline for the Out of Uniform series of romance <laughs> novels that she wrote is, uh, Give a seal an inch and he'll take your heart. Oh. And, uh, Are you sure it's not about Andre, the, the performing <laughs> seal? <laughs> Some of the titles to these uh, these novels, uh, you got your Hot and Heavy. Okay, classic. Hot and Bothered. Uh-oh. Feeling Hot. A lot of hot. Getting Hotter. You should take those uniforms off if they're so hot all <laughs> the time. I think that's what they're going to do. <laughs> and Hotter Than Ever. And I have a picture of uh, I have a, one of the covers. I got the Whoa. cover of Getting Hotter here. That, that guy is shredded oh, man. like look at that. Look at the fucking cum gutters on that guy. <laughs> yeah. Shredded like a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that guy has super abs. So if you're a Flophouse lady fan who's looking into some some sweet Navy Seal romance action, or a Navy Seal who's fantasizing about their fellow Navy Seals, they repeal, don't ask, don't tell. We're equal opportunity. Sure. Or if you just want to read about some the thing that somebody else will be reading if they're fantasizing about you. Wait, <laughs> if you're a Navy wait Seal, a minute, I got confused for a second. <laughs> if you're a Navy Seal and okay. you want to project yourself into the story, okay, Ninja what Turtles. Turns you you said something about a Ninja Turtle. The idea of someone else being turned on by you, <laughs> and who is not turned on by that? Yeah. Then go to lkennedy.com and check out these series of uh, romance novels. Remind- maybe, we'll, maybe we'll get a set and give it away as a gift pack for uh, the latest Flophouse contest winner. Which one's that? Do What's we have a contest? contest going on? Dan, you remember. What's that contest? <laughs> no, we don't have a contest going on. <laughs> Although I was thinking that we should have another one where the uh, Let's make it up on the spot. To- uh, name the movie that we review. We haven't done one of those in a while. Oh, that's right. We should do another one of those. Uh, it, she reminded me of those titles. Reminded me of my favorite ever romance title that I saw when I worked at Barnes Nobles. It was called Millionaire Cop <laughs> and Pregnant Mom to Be. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, perfect. Everything I need is right in the title. Right up there with the Billionaires and Babies series. So uh, this last letter. What was the, the what was the URL for that website again? It's L Kennedy. L the letter or E L L E E L L E as it like uh, like the, the magazine L okay sure okay L I mean, there's L. also an L magazine in New York City uh, like like L Woods star of uh, Legally Blonde let's say okay um, Wait, what? I thought it, her letter. name was just L period E L L E okay Kennedy Kennedy com. like the president for okay. romance novels yeah. Um, for all Thank your you for romance novels, novels needs. Thanks for everybody for writing in. Oh, are there more letters? There's one more letter for the evening, and it's titled "Good Directors, <clears throat> Bad Movies." It's from Andrew, last name withheld. He writes Dear- Zimmern of Bizarre Foods. <laughs> Dear House Cat, at all. Listening to the Paperboy episode got me thinking about one of my favorite directors. No, not Lee Daniels. I'm Daniel huge- Lee. <laughs> I'm a huge Pedro Almodovar fan, huh. and the idea of him almost directing a trashy American knockoff of his other work is weirdly upsetting to me. I feel like an Almodovar paperboy would have been so bad it could have made me love all of his movies a lot less. Suddenly I'd be rewatching Bad Education or Talk to Her, and I'd just imagine the whole thing in English with mumbly accents, weird camera dissolves, and Gail Garcia Bernal getting peed on. 
Has a director that would have been a much better scene. <laughs> has a director ever made a movie or run of movies that's such a grotesque self parody that it made his or her earlier better films seem so much worse to you in retrospect? A common example of this might be Wes Anderson before he won most people back with Moonrise Kingdom, or Woody Allen at various points in his career. I feel like Woody Allen is a go to, and another one is Steven Spielberg. Where sure. some of his recent movies have just been not – he set such a high standard with a lot of his earlier movies and his more recent ones are so mixed and uneven. Yeah, I mean I don't know that there's but like – But I don't know that I'd like, I'd like his older ones less as a result. It's hard to think of a director where the problem is that his movies are such a grotesque parody of themselves that they – Make you like his earlier movies less. I mean, I don't have that feeling with us, with us Anderson. I can understand that kind of criticism more with him. It's more that often, you know, directors only have a certain number of good movies in them sometimes. Like, no one bats, you know, 100%. I, I That was a terrible, I don't know how to use sports metaphors. <laughs> no, no, but, yeah, they bat 100%. <laughs> But no one, you know, like no one, no it's one's the best is that, record. Is that a baseball. possible thing to have? Is yeah. that a hundred percent of something? No one's great. <laughs> Wait all a minute, the time. I don't even think that's likely. I mean, like <laughs> I tried to watch um, Alfred Hitchcock's Topaz recently, and it's, I could like, not get through. I, I literally had to There's one good sequence in that, and it's not very. It's the rest is not very good. Nobody. I mean, there's the only directors you could say have all good movies are the ones that like died, died young. young, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, but even like. You got guys like Francis Ford Coppola who made some of the best movies ever. Like The Godfather is arguably the best movie ever, mm-hmm. and The Conversation is amazing. Apocalypse Now is amazing, but then he made a lot of movies like Jack that are not so amazing. Bram Stoker's Dracula. Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is one he put a lot of work into too. Like yeah. that was not a work for hire job. But there are also like the directors like Tim Burton who. Uh, like have their work has curled. Oh yeah, that's my answer, Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Well, but he's the thing with Tim Burton. That's maybe you're right. That's the one where the deficiencies of his later work show up the weaknesses of his earlier work because he's such an he's such a good visual stylist, but he's not a great storyteller. And so when his style got boring, it was well, like, now, oh, I mean, now wait that, a minute. Now that uh, sort of a breathtaking visual style is so easy to achieve with CGI, and it becomes. Dull, like what what yeah. what was once idiosyncratic as mainstream, and he hasn't moved past it. Like something like Alice in Wonderland is nothing but visuals, but they're all kind of like ugly, samey CGI visuals. Well, and especially when you've influenced so many young directors, yeah. yeah. Well, there's well, when, no, there's, the, when, there's when no so much of the goth anarchy. movement feels like it comes out of his designs, you know. Yeah. Yep. Like Robert Smith and Tim Burton, pretty much. Yeah, I feel like I feel like Robert Smith and Edward Scissorhands are basically where that comes from. And like, once everything looks like that, you know, it's it loses its its uniqueness. Mm-hmm. But a lot of his earlier stuff, when you go back, like Beetlejuice is still great. Yeah, when you look back and look like the Batman movies he did are not very good. You know, but the best stuff from his early career, I think, is the craziest. The stuff where. There is no kind of rational design to it. It is really just his brain spilling out in a movie Mm -hmm. like Beetlejuice or something. uh, I mean, like this is less Tim Burton necessarily as the auteur of it. But like Pee-wee's Big Adventure Mm -hmm. is a is a great clash between his sensibility and Paul Rubin's sensibility. And that's it works. It's amazing. And for a long time, I would have said that the Coen brothers had pretty much as close to a perfect record as anybody else. But then they kind of had a run of stinkers. Just a couple in a mm-hmm. row, and that was enough to throw it off, you know. But they're still, as as they're still, got one of the higher averages, I would think. Yeah. Um, Probably but, the highest average would be Jean Vigo. Sure, <laughs> so I was going to say made... Stuart Gordon. <laughs> oh yeah, or sure, Stuart Gordon too. I mean, I mean that's a thousand percent. <laughs> but like guys who made like a movie, three movies, like or like wait, Jean Vigo is basically like. One full movie and a couple of shorts. And a couple of shorts. Like, that's a pretty good way to keep your your average up is to make a bunch of good movies like that and then die. So um, so this is the last segment on the podcast where we okay. recommend something that you might like to watch. Usually what about the one in, where we, concre- <clears throat> in contrast to what we watched. What about the segment where we but, create a resolution to become better people for the next episode and then the next episode we report on it? How we that's done? been cut. Oh, boy. So we're just jerks again, huh? Yeah. Woo! You're off the chain. Elliot off the chain. Starfucker. Elliot Unchained. Coming this May. Starfucker. Rated R. (laughs) Rated NC-17. They brought back the X rating for it. Oh, wow. And it's on TV? It's on ABC Family, yeah. Oh, okay. 
it's very strange, but you know, hey, they put up the money. I think it's weird. Do they say ABC Family because they want the whole family to be there, or uh, because it's it's actually the original name of the channel was ABC Head of the Family? Oh, whoa! <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> but unfortunately, too many people messed with the head, and you know what happens then. <laughs> There's too much new it's Jack London Lavelle, and uh, the FCC shut it down. And too much sure. new Jack London. <laughs> yep. Anyway, so what's the segment about? This We're segment recommend movies we like is recommendations. Usually, a contrast to the movie we watched, but in so a turn off your listening in a week where we watched Stolen. I don't know if there's a better movie that we can recommend, but we'll try. I think, yeah, we probably can find a better movie. Uh, no. Stu Rat, what do you have? Okay. This might be a little contentious. <laughs> you guys all know me. I'm a bit of a, what they might call a gore hound. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm actually, I'm going to recommend a movie titled Universal Soldier Day of Reckoning. I think the like seventh movie in the Universal Soldier uh, series. Based on the song of the same I name. I am already expecting big fans of the Unisol mythos to be writing in as we speak. <laughs> Unisol? It sounds like Unisol. an all purpose cleaner. I know, right? But that's what it's called. Um, so Universal Soldier, Day of Reckoning, it's a later uh, later uh, sequel. It does have Jean-Claude Van Damme, Dolph Lundgren, and some other dudes in it. Uh, <laughs> so just the two of them? Wait, real quick. This is a movie that, uh, let's see, uh, Uptal Das, a user of IMDb, <laughs> describes as not Universal Soldier, avoid at all costs. <laughs> And another one, Dan Cardozo underscore 22 says, let me just say, this is in fact the worst Universal Soldier movie ever. <laughs> Wait, but somehow, face. somehow you liked Glowing it. Glowing recommendations. Uh, it's, no, it's actually pretty good. It, it's a movie that like plays around with the, like I guess, the background. It's surprisingly, well, it's very violent. It's always, the original Universal Soldier was uh, kind of a, a fun sci-fi action, almost horror movie. Like and this, a romp. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with, a, with a breakout performance by a young kid named Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> Not at but, all. No, <laughs> but um, this, this latest Universal Soldier movie, uh, it kind of feels a little bit like if uh, Universal Soldier, uh, maybe one uh, Lost Highway or another David Lynch movie, <laughs> and The Raid colon Redemption managed to have some kind of weird baby. Uh, the action's really horrific and violent. And uh, there's a lot of weird slow moments that uh, take on almost a dreamlike quality. And it's got a very, uh, very low budget, uh, but it manages to be, if anything, kind of interesting. And for me, it works almost like a metaphor for violent action movies in general. So Mm -hmm. check it out if you're looking for a super weird, super gory and violent movie. Um, I'm going to break with the rules because I haven't seen movies that I enjoyed uh, since our last taping. So I'm just going to say... Is that because they were bad movies or because you are a curmudgeon? Probably both. Oh, okay. But uh, I watched storm. a couple of pilots that I enjoyed. So I'm going to recommend a couple of uh, television shows. I don't know whether they're going to maintain, but I enjoyed the, the first episodes. I watched uh, Hannibal. Okay. Um, everyone's mad about Mads. <laughs> Everybody well is know. mad about Mads. Um, it's ha- hard not to be. Look at him with those chiseled danish looks <laughs> it had a lot of the uh sort of serial killer bullshit that normally bothers me uh namely a profiler who walks into a scene of the crime and uh basically knows what happened immediately but somehow <laughs> this made was some that... kind of valhalla rising in here <laughs> <laughs> but it somehow made that character work by making him more of a uh damaged live wire uh like empathetic to the point of having trouble surviving in the world character um and uh it genuinely felt creepy in the way that a serial killer entertainment hasn't done in a while and i also enjoyed a bbc american show by the name of orphan black about a woman who encounters a uh her exact double on a subway platform right before she commits suicide the double or her um the double commits suicide And she steps into the double's life because of problems in her own uh, existence and soon finds that she's at the center of some sort of weird conspiracy. And she has twice the problems she had before. Uh, And it's a fun show. So those are the two that I would recommend. So Hannibal and Orphan Black? Yeah. And I'm going to recommend a movie that I saw in life because this is a movie podcast. <laughs> Thanks uh, for clarifying. I thought we were, this was uh, what the boob tube, <laughs> the tube show? cast, uh, the tube house. 
uh, mm-hmm. which is actually about, about tube tops. Two- <laughs> we love them. You wear them. Let's talk. The tube house. Uh, Bare shoulders, thumbs up. <laughs> I'm going to recommend a documentary movie. This is a real life movie. Okay. Kind of. It's called Room 237. Uh, and it's gotten a little bit of buzz. It's a documentary about the movie. It's about bees. <laughs> it's called <laughs> A Bee Story. <laughs> it's called A Bee Movie. Uh, Room 237. It's a documentary about The Shining. Uh, but not about the making of the movie. It's about. There's five different people whose interpretations of the film are gone into in great detail, and their interpretations are, to say the least, wrong. Uh, And they range from the semi-plausible that the movie is a metaphor for either the Holocaust or the killing of the Native Americans by the American government, to the very implausible that this is the movie that Stanley Kubrick made to reveal to the world that he faked the moon landing or this one woman who just kind of says stuff about minotaurs and children that don't really make any sense. Uh, but what the movie is really about, and you don't, there's no narrate. The only narration in this movie is from the people talk, telling their theories. You don't see them on screen. All the footage from the movie is either taken from the shining or other movies. And there's a little bit that I think was shot for this film in a, in a movie theater. But for the most part, it's all, footage that's been edited and uh, slowed down or reversed or looped. Uh, And it's a really fascinating movie about how people can take a movie like The Shining and read so much into it and devote so much of their time and energy to puzzling out what they assume are very deliberate hidden meanings put there by this godlike director, Stanley Kubrick, who has control over every detail on screen at any given moment and every single instance of anything in the movie – and just kind of a fascinating look at how people wrap themselves up in a film and get lost in it. And the way that it's edited I thought was really interesting and seems to me one of the few documentaries I've seen in a movie theater that felt like it had taken the lessons of the documentaries you see on like YouTube where they will replay footage, where they'll zoom in on things, where they'll like create computer models that fit the footage, like all sorts of different things. And the music in it sounds like the kind of music that John Carpenter writes for his movies with like a lot of keyboard and stuff and synthesizer. It's all super, synth, super baby. awesome. So the whole thing, it's really good and it, and it creates this kind of hypnotic spell all around The Shining. This movie that is basically like a good kind of high class horror movie. And at the end, it feels like these people are trying to rationalize to themselves why they like this movie that like... They can't like a movie that has a bunch of skeletons in it and an elevator full of blood. There must be some deeper meaning to it, and they seem to be kind of fooling themselves in ever-descending circles. Why don't they just ask uh, Stanley Cooper to explain it? Well, he died about 20 years ago, and everyone who knew Stanley (laughs) Kubrick who was (laughs) – yes. And everyone – since then, since the movie came out, everyone who was involved in The Shining seems to be saying, this is total crap. (laughs) None of these things these people are saying are true. But the point of it is not whether mm-hmm. these theories Someone are... Someone got to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick's ghost. Shutting him up. Stanley Boobrick. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, he's got boobs? No, no. Boo I like the idea of this ghost. No, got... He's a ghost. He's Boobrick. Not... <laughs> no, not... <laughs> the chestiest ghost around. No. Uh, but it's it's a really fascinating movie and a really hypnotic, and it made me really want to watch The Shining again, which honestly is not a feeling I've had in 11 years. So uh, it was really good. I recommend it. Room 237. Well, guys... So a couple of solid recommendations. Yep. <laughs> you mean you guys, right? Because no, you're mad at me for no, no, we're not mad. I mean, we're it's, maybe a little mads you, about you. <laughs> no. We are mads about you, Dan. Not as mad as we are about mads, <laughs> but we're mads about McCoy. Yep. Same way uh, Helen Hunt was mads about Paul Reiser. Except, uh, uh, let's just keep going. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you know, <laughs> whenever we talk about a Nicolas Cage. A film, it's like Christmas, but Christmas has to end. Does and it? And so does the flop house. Um, are, wait, are you breaking la- up with us? Is this the last episode? Yeah, are guys. you dumping us? <laughs> I found are you a, I found dumping a new podcast. us? <laughs> <laughs> From now on, I'm in love with How Did This Get Made? Wait, what? Is this a bit? For the flop house, <laughs> I've been Dan McCoy. Okay, uh, I guess I'm Stuart Wellington. <laughs> and I'm Elliot Kalin, the end question mark. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. What? <laughs> but- <laughs> I didn't know you had the hazing on DVD. Awesome. Uh-
that's a relatively recent development. That yes. is an awesome purchase. Awesome For purchase. lovers of pumpkin butts and Brad Dorif. <laughs> Sounds like a character from a James Bond movie, awesome purchase. <laughs> uh, you meant pumpkin butt. <laughs> we haven't talked about Timothy Chevis' pumpkin butt in a long time. Aw, oh, pumpkin butt. <laughs> <laughs> pumpkin butt, I knew you were behind this. <laughs> I detected your foul stench when I got on <laughs> no, way. No, why is Chunk, uh, Why is James Bond talking like Princess Leia? <laughs> but, uh... The game's over, pumpkin butt. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they call me? That's so hurtful. 